and Mr. Naidu volunteered to be one of those to mentor our students in his capacity as a young global leader, in a way to mentor and inspire young people um, so that we could indeed live true to our mantra, which is capping global leaders. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, may I, with those words, welcome the young global leader, the young executive in residence, Mr. Yuvan Naidu, to lead the lecture. Thank you. But the message is that leaders are not, are not born, they're created. And um, with all humility, we sit on the shoulders of the leaders of our generation who are here, particularly Minister Praveen Gordon. It's a great honor to have you. Dr. Moyo, your work across Africa has been remarkable. Mr. Sheikh, your leadership and vision at DBSA is, 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 is driving a lot of action and excitement. Polo, you helped craft BEE. And Mr. Kovadia, you are a mentor to many of us. So it's a great honor to be here. The origins of the master class um, is therefore based on a practitioner's perspective because it's practitioners that have the experience on the ground to marry the academia as well as uh, the real action. Part of what we're working towards is the private equity diamond, a lens with which to make decisions. So are there any volunteers as to what's the first part of the private equity diamond? Priya. It's people. Absolutely. So we start off with people, and in each of our cases, it may seem like a simple concept. We analyze the people aspect of any particular deal. What's the second aspect? Tanisha, it's context. In any deal, what's the context of what you're engaging in? So in our deal of looking at the large purchasing Cadbury Schweppes, the analysis that sugar prices were going to drop was one of the inputs that made the deal attractive. People saw the changes happening around them. Particularly in Africa, context is key. Local partners, having them on board, the changes in regulation. To some, it's a competitive advantage understanding these. To others that don't take the time to get the context, do it at your peril. <coughs> Lastly, third item, anyone? Nivesh? Opportunity. Opportunity. What's the opportunity? What does this actually present? What's the market share? What's the market size? We discussed Nigeria and its attraction, China and its attraction, large markets. But what are the other drivers that are moving it? And last point in the diamond. The deal. The deal. This is the hard work. You can't get away from knowing your corporate finance and the discipline, the terms of the deal, how you structure it. And so we analyzed the Bain Capital deal of Edcon and its purchase. I worry about the hype around this growth story and let me tell you why I worry. So until Africa gets to a point where we can relate the plans that we lay, the execution of those plans and the results that we get, we need to be careful about getting too excited about these results. Because when you look and drill down, how are we getting these results? What are the drivers for these results? A lot of it is to do with things that are outside of our control. So can we really claim that these results are because of us? Can we be certain that there's going to be sustainability in terms of this performance? So I'm saying things are fundamentally shifting in Africa, maybe not at the pace that we would like it to be, and the political institutions that have given rise to, to, to the kind of integration of markets are starting to take place, they're starting to deepen. And I think that's, that's a lot that's going to happen in regard to the maturing of these institutions that allows the economic parts of it to go. The national interest of South Africa is to integrate its economy into SADC. Already, if you just take SADC, about 220 million people, at the top side you're 50. This in terms of expansion of markets in SADC, already there is an enormous market and in terms of our advanced economy, we could, that market is something that we used to enter. But here's the problem. The problem is are we integrating in those markets because we think we can exploit the economies there and that's the, the, the problem I have with many of the approaches we take. We need to integrate in those markets because firstly, yes, the bottom line in business school, if you're not growing, you are dying. And part of South Africa's economy is that it is not integrating fast enough into the SADC region, and that is where your competitors are coming in. Okay, I, I mean, in South Africa, it, it's common cause now that, that at the financial sector we fared pretty well during the 
beginning of the crisis, which was the financial crisis. And, and I just want to disagree with the point you made earlier, and, and I keep on saying this. It hasn't been a global financial crisis. It's been a U.S. and European financial crisis. Okay? Uh, the, the seeds of the crisis started in the U.S. because they did bloody lousy lending. Uh, and, and, and then it spread to Europe. Uh, and, and, and it led to a global economic crisis. But, but it, it wasn't a global financial crisis. Given, given the strength of our financial sector in this, country, in this country compared to all parts of the continent, I think we have a responsibility in being very careful about the way we do business. And just on the culture issue and, and the language issue and so on, and then maybe your students can comment on this. To, at some at times, I get surprised. To me, it's, it's business ABC to understand culture and markets and respond to those culture and markets. If you don't do it, you're not, you, you, you're not running a sustainable business. So I'm so surprised that, pe that business people go in there and don't actually take those things into account. Are we stepping up to the full potential of what can be done? Yeah, look. Those issues are valid issues, but let, let me make some of the points that are made continuous. In, in SME finance, for instance, between 2003 and 2008, banks plowed in 15 billion rand in financing black SMEs. One of the things related to SME lending is that every time we talk about SME finance, we only look at debt finance. Now, no business can survive on debt finance alone. I think one of the biggest problems we've got, and we're talking about this and trying to do something about it, is that we don't have a venture capital market for small medium enterprises in this country. Does venture capital exist in South Africa? Um, in 2007, I would have said no, uh, absolutely. Uh, now, I will say to some extent, uh, but w whether the, f the format in which it, it exists is relevant for our requirements, I would say no. The reality is that your typical South African entrepreneur today does not have the skill or the, the, the experience that you, know, you would typically be looking for when it comes to, to venture capital. Now in South Africa, uh, your typical entrepreneur is not the guy who's going to come up with the best high-tech idea. It's somebody who's going to find um, a business opportunity, probably in an area that is already serviced, but perhaps there's a particular niche within the area that is not specifically serviced, for instance. Or there is a, you know, they're, they're doing a business, they're replicating a model that somebody else has done, but the, the, the demand is such that there is sufficient room for you know, more than one player. Um, and because of, of, the na of, of that kind of entrepreneur, they are then not able to, to access a, a venture capital funding. We, we do have a dual economy. We've got a first world a banking system that serves uh, you know, your Anglos and, and, and big corporates of this world very nicely, but then you've also got the other end of the market that needs to be serviced and our banking system cannot service that market and we do need i believe um, a very strong almost public private partnership if, if you will uh, where government together with civil society and the private sector come together and say what institutions should we be coming up with that is going to service this market you know part of this panel is strategy to execution and we have many young and budding entrepreneurs here you're seeing these business plans uh, day in and day out. So what's your top 10 or, or bullet points trick to, to the folks in the room on strategy to execution? When you look at those entrepreneurs and they're coming with this plan and their hope, what makes you pick one and not pick one? What's that magic in it or is it magic or is there a system to it? And just some bullet points. I, I, it's, it's what your students said, the people. Uh, when you, we, you play in this market, you play in the people space, you know, first and foremost. The numbers come later. If the people are right, then you can have a conversation. And uh, it takes a lot of time for you to figure out whether the people are the right people or not. Because even if the business plan is out of this world, if the people are wrong, they will run it down. We've got to find innovative solutions to the complex problems that we find. And, and for me, uh, those who take risks are those who develop essentially unique solutions for their clients' problems. And, and that's, that's how we see ourselves in, in that situation. So, so what I would like to tell him, 
is that let's sit down together and look at the project. Let's talk about how we allocate capital between the public and the private sector. Let's talk about how we allocate risk. Let's understand that the private sector needs a return and how do we, we structure this thing to, have it, to, to do that? And how do you use taxpayers' money to actually structure with us the deal and we do this together and we then move forward together. That's, that's what I'd like to tell him, okay? Now, 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 <laughs> now, now the, the, <laughs> the, the, and, and I, I'm using that to illustrate a point. I think that the tenor of our engagement between the public and private sector has, has become an unconstructive one. Mm. All stakeholders are not equal all the time. Okay, we Not need to understand, mm -hmm. we need to understand that democracy doesn't mean that on a particular project, everybody, all sectors of civil society, <laughs> need to be involved in how the project unfolds. Okay, and that's why we don't take decisions. The one thing that South Africa has completely <laughs> failed at doing, and this is both uh, development financing institutions and, and, and the private sector, we've completely failed to work together in terms of tackling the opportunity on the continent. And my view is that if there are people who are supposed to benefit on, on, the, uh, on the opportunities that the, the continent presents, it's South Africa. We, you know, we've got the skill, we've got the resources, financial and otherwise, we should be uh, exploiting it. And I'm not suggesting that we know Africa better than most, but certainly we've got much more of an affinity with our uh, continental counterparts than, than the rest of the world. But China is on the continent, they haven't come through South Africa, it's true, and everybody else. So I think it's a great pity and I think there's an opportunity there to to try and rectify that situation. I do think we need to start being creative around how we respond to the issue of, of, of small business funding. Small businesses are the ones that are going to solve the socioeconomic challenges that we face in this country. That's a fact. Big business is not going to do that. Government has got wonderful policies when it comes to economic, de uh, economic uh, uh, development. They have got good policies on, when it comes to SME funding and, and, and SME development. But we, we, sh we are yet to properly capacitate our institutions to sufficiently address the market. I often tell them that, you know, the problem that you have is that you've got these big institutions, you've set up offices throughout the whole country, and then you've gone and hired people who've got become degrees to go and, uh, uh, and, and assess business uh, plans. They've never run businesses in their lives. They've never been trained on how to properly assess a business, they, you know. Uh, and when, again, when you go to countries like India, when you do a, a BCom degree, you decide whether you're going to do, uh, you're going to uh, specialize in entrepreneurship and, and, and SME funding, and you're properly trained to do uh, those types of assessments. So in South Africa today, we have got these wonderful policies. We talk big about SME, M, SMEs, but as far as I'm concerned, we have done absolutely nothing to address the problem of SME funding. And one of the things that uh, business schools and uh, these sorts of classes do is talk about leaders and, and leadership. And there's no doubt that in South Africa today, the kind of mix that I see in this room is one which is uh, solely required to provide a new kind of leadership, uh, both within South Africa and within the continent. A kind of leadership that stops uh, mourning what the other guy or person is doing or not doing kind of leadership that's uh, willing to understand that we are just a 19-year-old democracy and we have formidable uh, achievements behind us, but equally formidable tasks ahead of us. A kind of leadership that is still willing to say that the Mandela tradition, the Sisulu tradition, the Tambo tradition, of sacrificing a little of our time, energy, and resources for the general good is as important as what we do for ourselves as individuals. Something that business schools, I think, don't teach enough. Because leaders in South Africa, like anywhere else in the world, have to set the tone. They have to either say to the rest of society, we, notwithstanding our differences, recognize that we have common challenges that we want to confront. We recognize that we need to work together on certain things and disagree on other things. We recognize that we have more things to agree on, in South Africa particularly, and indeed on the African continent. Agreement that we don't need the kind of poverty we have. And what are the consequences 
of having an extremely bloated financial sector, where as a result of algorithms, as a result of what we call inverted commas creativity, and so on, you have lots of money being made by very few people across the globe. And the question that everybody is asking around the globe is if you're putting in money, as the US is, at the rate of $85 billion a month uh, into the system, where's that money going? It was meant to boost the real economy. In the United Kingdom, when they put in some 375 billion pounds, they said this was borrowing for lending. We allow you to borrow from us as a central bank so that you can lend to the real business. Very little of that has filtered into the real economy. Why? Many commentators over the last three or four years are in fact arguing that the financial sector needs to get back to its core business. And its core business is to support businesses in the real economy, or let's put it more generally, enterprises in the real economy. But today we also see the consequences of interconnectedness in terms of perceived risk. We talked a lot about risk and responses to the risk. And how culture, geographic location, orientation in terms of how certain people with capital see the less developed part of the world determines how risk is perceived, how risk is calculated, and how risk is acted upon. And so over the last few years, you've had rapid inflows into uh, developing countries when the time was right, so to speak, and the interest rate differentials were right, and where the sentiment was saying that's where money is going to be made. Equally, we've been pointing out for many years now, last three or four years, that with this camp is going to be a risk because when sentiment changes, then we're going to have rapid outflows. The important question also that arises from this crisis is, in fact, on, on the question of risk, the failure of the risk machinery in the banks. Now, whether you can describe it as fat tails or black swans or any other color swans, the fact of the matter is human beings haven't quite developed the capability yet to anticipate and understand and command over every development that's likely to happen. And a little bit of humility would be very useful. The humility to understand what we don't understand. The humility to understand that we can't control all events around us. And the humility to understand that human behavior uh, can't be quite dictated to as we think uh, that we could at, uh, through these processes. So, an interesting assignment will be how and why did the risk machinery in the banking system fail? How and why did ratings agencies give AAA grading to what were essentially rotten products? And there's no doubt that there are phenomenal uh, opportunities that have arisen out of the kind of resources that have been discovered, the boost in economic growth on the basis of those resources, and a better understanding of what we need to do on the African continent in respect of diversifying the economy, building our human and political capital, and ensuring that we choose, uh, if you like, the right partners as we begin to fo move forward on our own development path. And so I suppose the bottom line for new entrepreneurs and, and policy makers on the continent is to find a way of leading, uh, and, and this is a fascinating topic for yourselves, what does leading structural change mean? What are the complexities involved in transforming an economy, in reforming uh, the economic balances in a society? Because there are always going to be winners and losers. There are always going to be insiders and outsiders. And I think one of the biggest areas that we need to focus all the kind of intellectual energy we have here is <coughs> on leading structural change in societies. So in sum, I'm arguing that the new entrepreneurial model uh, is about innovating new models in a, in a more holistic way, which takes into account the political, the economic, the social, and the broadly developmental uh, and sustainability issues as well in a very different kind of way than perhaps others have done it elsewhere in the world. And in that sense, Africa and its uh, capable people have interesting opportunities available to them. Many of our problems are common with the rest of the world. But what's more important is the potential that we have to reshape this country and this, and this continent 
over the next 10 or 20 years with leaders like yourselves is huge. Grab it. Thank you.